Hello. Hello, everybody. Hopefully, everyone can hear me. Uh, Val, you, um, am I coming through okay? Excellent. Um, well, thank you very much, for everyone, for uh, joining me this evening for a really great discussion on fire, um, why we burn the woods, why controlled burning is important, um, sort of a history of, uh, of uh, fire in Florida, a little history also of the folks that came to Florida to stop fire. So this is going to be a lot of really cool stuff. And so um, we anticipate lots of good questions um, at the end of this. And so I guess I'll just simply start by introducing myself and why you would tune in to a presentation hosted by me. So my name is Zachary Prusak. I am the current Florida fire manager for the Nature Conservancy. And I have been involved in the field of fire management, fire ecology for about almost 34 years now. So I graduated from the University of Central Florida uh, with a biology degree uh, and I studied ants a long, long time ago. So some of you listening to this conversation right now um, probably have heard me talk about ants because I can give a whole presentation on that. Um, but my um, interest in ants was sort of diverted to a career in fire when I first joined the Florida Park Service after I graduated. And it was an interest that has propelled me to where I am today. And it's one of the most important it's one of the most important things I've done uh, pretty much in my life from a conservation standpoint, because the success of conservation, the success of sustaining habitats and species globally is greatly dependent on two main forces, fire and water. And so I'm very honored to have worked um, with the Florida Park Service, uh, the Brevard County Environmentally Endangered Lands Program, um, of course, the Nature Conservancy right now. I was a private contractor for a while, and I even worked for the government of Walt Disney World, Reedy Creek Improvement District, also doing fire um, on uh, Disney property. So um, I've had quite the uh, sort of career path, and it's been uh, I've met so many incredibly uh, amazing people over this span. And so tonight I'm just going to basically condense what I could spend days talking about into a nice, concise presentation about why it's important, why we do it, and uh, again, why we set the woods on fire. So Valerie, are we set to go? All right. So now, if everything works out well, I will share my screen and we will have a presentation pop up. Mm -hmm. All righty, how about now? Can you, can you see that? All righty, hang on there, no problem. Um, da -da -da -da. And there it is, this we will share. How does that look, Val? Do I get a thumbs up? That's great. <laughs> Excellent. Okay. So, so, all right, great. So, we're going to talk, this is called Fire in Florida, Biodiversity through Pyrodiversity. So, pretty much every bit of diversity that you see and a lot of these upland habitats comes from a variety or a diversity in fire. So hence the pyrodiversity um, sort of uh, description there. So I work for the Nature Conservancy and the Nature Conservancy for all of its uh, many, many years really has been focusing on either uh, you know, saving the last great places, um, saving the last great places on earth, conserving the lands and waters of, on which all life Depends, which is our current tagline, we have protecting nature, preserving life. So the Nature Conservancy, if we are really invested in conserving the uh, diversity on life, that means we have to conserve the processes that have 
supported, and at some point created this diversity, and fire is one of them. I show this slide. This slide is an interesting uh, picture from the very first group of individuals that actually started the Nature Conservancy up in the Northeast, up in New York. And I, I, I use this to make the point that committed individuals, and at this time, no one in this uh, slide had any full-time, you know, there was, they were not paid by the Conservancy, they were volunteers. And so people that are dedicated individuals can make a big difference in conservation. So if you're with the Native Plant Society, you're with the Nature Conservancy, um, individuals make a huge difference. And so these individuals started the Nature Conservancy, similar to the folks involved in the Native Plant Society and any other conservation group you belong to, you do make a difference. Um, and so I definitely want to make that point. If any of you listening to me right now are members of the Nature Conservancy, I thank you a thousand times because you have allowed us to go forth and make a big difference. And so thank you if anyone listening to this is a part of the nature. Now let's talk about fire. So fire is fascinating on so many levels. This grouping of pictures shows a wide variety of spiritual, religious symbols that all are um, associated with fire. Um, the burning bush, you've got uh, birds that deliver fire. Uh, fire has been a part of our our fiber. Uh, I've listened to some fire um, socioecologists who will go as far to say that the very survival of our species millions of years ago depended upon the ability to uh, create and nurture fire. Um, many of the cave paintings, like in Alaska or Alaska, uh, France, some of them are only visible with fire. Um, there is this great uh, association, again, of fire through culture over time. So this is just one aspect of the impact fire in of itself as a process has made um, over, you know, millions of years with people. If we go right now down to Florida, why is fire important to us in Florida? So the climate, the geography, and the culture all combined have created a landscape that has been so we say climate, you know, and we'll see some slides that go into more detail with that. Why is climate important? Fire. Geography, we basically stick out in the middle of the Atlantic Ocean and the warm Gulf of Mexico. And then culture, a little bit to that uh, previous slide, we have had many different cultures in Florida that have depended on fire, use fire, lit the state on fire. So Florida has, similar to other uh, places around the world, it's a place where people really have um, nurtured fire as it's you know given to them uh, by this lightning. So lightning, we have a lot of lightning in Florida. We are the we are um, the location that has the highest uh, frequency of lightning strikes per square mile than anywhere else in North America. So those of you who have lived here for a long time. You know that there's all kinds of dangers in Florida. You know, uh, I've got relatives that live in Kentucky, and they always say, oh, my gosh, the alligators will kill you in Florida. But no, it's lightning that will kill you or really bad drivers, one of those two. But we've had a lot of lightning in Florida for millennia. If you look at us compared to the rest of the world, this is a really cool map that shows in the darker the color, the more lightning strikes per square mile or per square kilometer. And you can see where Florida in the southeast has a lot of lightning strikes per square mile. But also look around the world, Africa and uh, Asia, parts of um, Australia and South America. This, the earth is a giant static ball spinning through space, generating lots of static energy, which means lots of lightning has always been here. And when you have lightning, you have fire. And so basically, if you're looking at this sort of uh, equatorial distribution of lightning, you also have an equatorial distribution of habitats that burn readily, and their diversity depends on fire. To zoom in a little bit more, let's go down to Florida. So we know the southeast is a place where lots of uh, lightning strikes happen. Florida, we have tons and tons and tons of lightning. So more than any other state in the southeast, Florida also has a widely diverse plant um, community and the species that also their life cycles depend upon a frequent cycle of fire. 
So this is a picture that would, if I would, if I were to tell you what would a lightning um, caused fire look like, well, this is it. But just between all of us here, just us on this um, presentation, this actually is a picture from a helicopter where we um, actually are using these ping pong ball devices that light the woods on fire. But the effect is the exact same because it's very tough to get a picture of a lightning you know, cause fire. But this was this. Uh, imagine this scene uh, all over Florida um, for millions of years. Lightning would hit a tree. The tree would catch fire at the base. The fire would spread. And so this pretty much was the scene in Florida um, and other parts of the world uh, for a long, long time. Now, let's throw people. We haven't been around uh, for a very long part of um, sort of this, the age of the Earth and the age of our habitats, but we have had a big impact on fire. So the upper picture, Native Americans, it's been um, demonstrated time and time again through records and all kinds of archives that they utilize the tool of fire for a wide variety of reasons, whether you're actually... Um, growing food, whether you're driving game, whether you're actually using it as uh, a part of warfare. Uh, the Native Americans throughout our uh, country and the world have utilized fire and still utilize fire. It's a big part of the Aboriginal culture in Australia to this day. In the lower picture, you have sort of the cracker cattle culture where fire was utilized as a way to grow food for the cattle in Florida. There's great images in art of the longleaf pine forest that um, have uh, has uh, incorporated images of Native Americans setting it alight. Uh, again, for all the reasons I mentioned before, whether it's food or even there's records of indigenous peoples utilizing fire within these forests to clear paths, to walk, um, to clear out tall grass, which was assumed to have snakes and such. So there's a really interesting combination now between the historical fire frequencies and the much more recent um, uh, Aboriginal Native American use of fire. Combined, uh, these habitats that have been in this sort of belt of lightning now seem very uh, likely and more, um, uh, you know, the, the folks that lived in these habitats that were groomed by millions of years of lightning were very much um, presentable to the people that lived in that uh, to light fire for their use. I mentioned the Celtic cracker culture. Um, this is a fascinating subject for those of you who live in Florida and the Southeast. The folks that brought cattle over to Florida to earn a living found that the cattle that they um, actually uh, bred and utilized were able to get forage from sort of the Longleaf Flatwoods um, if it was burned often. And realize that what they had seen from the Native Americans burning, and of course what they had seen from lightning, allowed for um, a pretty robust um, culture and business model of growing um, cattle in Florida. But again, using fire as the tool to grow forage for the cows. So all of that combined, you would think, wow, you know, Florida uh, it's just this amazing fire state. You know, who would ever think to sort of put that out? So the Clark McNary Act of 1924 prohibited federal funding to any state that tolerated controlled burning. There was this great um, uh, movement of sort of anti-fire um, uh, sentiment. And a lot of it was funded through the U.S. Forest Service and also other timber industries. An example was this, the Dixie Crusaders. So they were a group of folks that traveled throughout the South and especially Florida bringing, and if you can look at that slide and see what that truck says, exhibits and motion pictures and lectures, forestry, better use of land. And you can see um, right behind the cab, it says stop woods fire. So look at these folks, very well-dressed, you know, uh, professional people. And they would come into towns in the South and they would show motion pictures. For example, the one called Burnin Bill in the bottom there that would try to persuade people to not light the woods on fire. And a lot of what was behind that was the timber industry. Because if you grow trees as a crop, you don't like fire. A fire will uh, char the trees, cause it to lose value. 
And so there was this in, uh, pretty, pretty strong movement that was supported a lot by some of the wildfires out west. Uh, there was the classic 1910 big burn. Um, so they were building on the sentiment of fire is something to be fought. It's not a natural process. And um, the people that do fire or light fire had something wrong with them. It's uh, this is really must be stopped at all costs. And so this is a fascinating part of our history. And there's so much written about this. Uh, I would recommend to anyone interested in the history of this um, to read to look up the books written by a fellow named Stephen Pine, P-Y-N-E. And yes, his last name is Pine, but an amazing fire historian that writes about uh, fire globally and is uh, especially interested in things like this, sort of the social aspects of fire. So these folks came into Florida and for the most part, were not successful in convincing some of the larger landowners to stop burning because some of those larger landowners were raising cattle and they knew that they were stewards of the land. They knew that their crop, their cattle would perish unless they burned. And so I will uh, definitely throw out a huge debt of gratitude to our larger land owners, which were the uh, families who raise cattle uh, for, mul for multiple generations. They literally and metaphorically kept the flame going in Florida because these uh, folks had a pretty impressive impact on some cities, but not all. And then there's this. So, you know, I started sort of this presentation with the deeper, almost spiritual aspects of the, of the place fire has globally in religions and culture and history. Well, it does also in uh, advertising and marketing. So we build on what the Dixie Crusaders started. Um, the push to, you, to fight fire almost on a military basis was really gained traction after World War II because many of our uh, military folks came back needing jobs. So fire suppression and fire uh, to fighting fire really took on a much greater um, goal uh, post-World War II, which resulted in lots of this. And you've all seen Smokey the Bear, incredible impact on making you have a visceral reaction to fire. Uh, I mean, look at that on the bottom left, this shameful waste weakens America. It's pretty impactful. And the child there on the lower picture in the middle, fire destroys his trees. And of course, Bambi. Uh, anyone who has watched Bambi remembers the fire scene. And my hats off to the amazing animators who did that. Incredible visceral reaction to this. So um, there has been a lot of um, marketing, a lot of work to make this point that fire in of itself isn't a natural process. It's really an enemy. We go from that to this. So uh, those of you uh, who have explored a lot of Florida will recognize some of these ecosystems. And what we'll do is we'll take a quick pyro tour of Florida. So the upper left is an example um, of coastal strand or coastal scrub. It's a really cool habitat. Over that um, horizon past the flames is the Atlantic Ocean. When I used to work in Brevard County, this is the stuff I used to burn uh, in the Archie Carr uh, Preserve and other places on the dune line. Those areas where they're really fascinating mix of um, salt spray impact and fire, which supported rare mice, uh, rattlesnakes. It's just it was great habitat. And for me personally, as a fire manager, I love the fact that my uh, eastern fire break was the Atlantic Ocean. That was great. You go toward the picture little bit uh, to the right, there's a pitcher plant bog. Pitcher plants are incredibly fire dependent. When I used to work for the Florida Park Service, um, I worked in, uh, I did some fires in Highlands Hammock State Park. And a unit we burned hadn't seen fire in 20 years. And when we did fire, what came out of that fire, what resprouted the quickest was pitcher plants. They had not been recorded in 15, 20 years in this unit. And so the bulbs were there waiting for fire to basically release them. On the upper right is pine uh, rocklands, which is uh, typical, of course, of the Keys in South Florida. Incredibly rare habitat, um, which is basically fire-dependent plants. Plop down on an old coral reef, 
Fire is incredibly important for this survival of this habitat because, as you can see just from that picture, uh, there's not much soil there. So the uh, recycling um, uh, process of fire is incredibly important to that habitat because it basically is growing on parts of itself that have burned. And there's all manner of rare uh, flowers and plants in that. You go down to the lower right, and that is the Everglades. So the river of grass actually is a river of fire because that fire right there is a fire creeping across um, vegetation that has water underneath it. There's all kinds of great literature and records of the Everglades burning um, for you know months, massive fires, which was and is a part of the recycling uh, um, process of the actual aquatic plants burned down during droughty times, much of that uh, organic layer burns down to sand, which allows for a much deeper uh, lake. So many of our lakes and wetlands in Florida, even our cypress domes, depend upon fire. The Everglades, great example. The lower middle, um, you could call it sand hill. Some people call it high pine. One of the best examples of this habitat is in the Wakawa Springs State Park, uh, Ordway Swisher Biological Station. Beautiful habitat. And it, if you burn that every two years, which is incredibly frequent, you get this amazing um, sort of a wheat field appearance to it. Beautiful habitat, incredibly rare in this form because it takes, because it, it depends on such a frequent fire. And then the lower left, something that is more akin to the Western habitats, the sand pine scrub. When it burns, it's this, what they call stand replacement fire. It's very unique to sand pine scrub. The sand pine trees themselves, incredibly um, weak, they get to a certain age, they fall down. Um, but when they burn, they release millions of seeds. The fire is incredibly hot, basically sterilizes a lot of the vegetation and soil around it. And what comes up after that? Sand pines. So it's a fascinating habitat, a challenge to fire managers. Um, my hat's off to the folks at Jonathan Dickinson State Park. They do a great job of managing sand pine scrub. Um, it is a habitat that will take over Sandhill. So if you don't burn Sandhill enough, sand pine scrub begins to come in. Um, and this is just a quick snapshot of the pyrogenic habitats in Florida, longleaf pine, scrub. You know, it's just there's so many of our 70 to 80 different habitats that have fire as a part of their um, life cycle. Any one of these can be altered or changed if you remove fire. If I take fire away from those pitcher plants, if I take fire away from that uh, sand hill, they will change into something else, which is a natural progression. But it is something as a fire manager and a fire ecologist, I'm very aware of that I have a responsibility to maintain what is unique about Florida. What is unique about Florida is its pyrodiversity. This is a great picture that shows a St. John's River Water Management District parcel um, that has this flower called Bartram's Ixia. And similar story, this hadn't been burned in about 10, 15 years, um, palmetto, gallberry, flatwoods, and it was burned. And it was a pretty hot fire. You can see the black in the middle. This picture was taken one month after the fire. So it was black down to the ground. This flower was not known from this unit. And it just exploded out of the ground. And so we don't, and I'll, I will admit, we don't document this stuff enough. The response of really rare species or unique species to, to fire. And so this is a great example of not only the dependence of rare species on fire, but the resilience of our land to fire. We, it's, if you burn longleaf flatwoods, and one day, the very next day, if you go back, you will see green shoots coming out of wiregrass, saw palmetto. Um, it's a pretty incredible part of the ecology of Florida, where since our soils are so poor, the stimulus, the, the, the fertilizing of fire really provides a pulse to regrowth. And it happens so quickly. But not just plants. Animals depend upon fire. Well, so this is a great, you know, small um, snapshot of the plants and animals that depend on fire. The Florida scrub jay in the upper left, which there's been so much research about, led by Archibald Biological Station. 
um, the flatwood salamander in the upper right were actually the habitat that salamander needs to uh, breed and lay eggs in requires fire to clear it out so it doesn't get overgrown. Um, gopher tortoise, uh, the grasshopper sparrow, all kinds of mints. And the animal in the middle is a very unique animal. It lives in the Florida Keys. It is a, a very unique and rare subspecies of rabbit. And it is a Civilagus palustris. Its subspecies name is Hefneri. So the late founder of the Playboy magazine, Hugh Hefner, directed funding to the research of this bunny. And it thrives in the Keys on, uh, an, on a military base and some other private land based on fire. If fire doesn't go through its habitat, it does not reproduce. So for those of you out there, this uh, is a, a shock you made. This, this presentation includes a picture of a Playboy bunny right there in front of you. But it shows the, the you know, this is really, I mean, this could go on for many, many, many different slides because the presence and absence of fire dictates the life cycle of many of these uh, plants and animals. Gopher tortoise is a great example where its adaptations to fire also involve its ability to quickly get out of the way. And so the picture on the lower left shows black all around this gopher tortoise. And it looks kind of weird at first. It's like, you know, was it a, is it a dead tortoise? Not at all. This gopher tortoise couldn't find its burrow. And so it basically made a safety zone for itself while the fire passed overhead. It was quite alive. The picture on the upper right shows it even further. This tortoise corkscrewed itself down into the ground, and you can see some ashes and some burned pine needles on the right-hand side. Gopher tortoises are amazing. Um, they have multiple burrows that they can escape a fire. But, the, the and this is kind of, these are rare pictures because we don't see this very often. This tortoise decided, I've just got to zip downwards, which of course makes sense because when a fire passes over, the heat rises up. There is little if any fire or heat impact to this animal below the surface of the soil. So a great picture of two animals that survived that fire. So, okay, we now have made the point that there's been lightning. Florida is a place where we've had lots of lightning fires. Florida is a place where we've had perhaps 10,000 years of Native American Aboriginal fire. We are also a place where we've had maybe 200 years years of folks who've raised cattle who use fire for agriculture reasons in Florida. Florida needs fire. Everything that you've just seen needs fire. Now, we as Floridians, we should be proud. Um, our state's about 34 million acres, and we've protected close to nine and a half million acres of land. So we have almost a third of our state protected in some form, state, federal, um, nonprofit like the Nature Conservancy. And this is a map of that. So all of the uh, shaded areas you see, the brown or federal, like um, Department of Defense or U.S. Forest Service, the green is state, like the Florida Park Service, the red is counties. We have a lot of counties with their own environmentally endangered lands program. And so now we've just said what you just saw, everything unique to Florida needs fire. But look at that. Look how distinct or not distinct, or how, look how disjunct all of this conservation land is. There are some great corridors, no doubt, and now we have a lot of people that live in Florida. So if we recognize what we've protected and we've invested in as taxpayers as unique, well, guess what? The land itself needs the processes that made it unique, that is fire. How do we do that? Do we let lightning go crazy, or do we give matches to 10-year-olds? Um, well, no. But we use something called prescribed fire or controlled burns. And in a nutshell, it's a safe way to apply a natural process to ensure ecosystem health and also a method to reduce wildfire risk. So it's a tool. Uh, you can think of it as, um, you know, if you are a gardener and you want to grow a certain crop, you use a certain tool for that. So for us, fire managers, fire ecologists, practitioners, uh, fire is our tool. And it's implemented by professionals for many reasons. If you are growing sugarcane, then you use fire for a specific reason. If you are working at Archibald, then you use fire incredibly specific to make sure that the scrub jays are healthy. If you work at Tall Timbers, you use fire for quail. 
um, all kinds of reasons to use fire. It also might include mechanical treatments of vegetation, which has its own interesting issues. Uh, I myself am a fan of that. You have to cut things down um, at certain times to ensure that the fire you plan and that you are in charge of is safe. And most importantly, it is in the Florida statutes. You as a landowner have the right to burn your land. It is recognized in the Florida statutes. Um, and just as a point of pride, many other states have used our statutes as models to create their own um, burning legislation to protect people to burn. California right now, as we speak, is taking our statutory language and modifying it to finally release some ability for private landowners to burn in California, which is a great uh, success story. Is it easy? Uh, so there's some challenges to doing this. Uh, long gone are the days when you could ride through your land on your horse, you know, strike a match on your horse's uh, saddle and just let the fire go and, you know, let your neighbor know. Doesn't happen anymore because development fragmentation of our landscape is of course as all of you know who are listening to this one of the biggest challenges to conservation in general roads development houses um you, it's the land that we need to burn you know in is in of itself it doesn't like to be fragmented and the more we fragment it the more of a challenge it is mainly because of smoke smoke the fire, and if it's the fire, we can we can control relatively uh, straightforward. Smoke's a big problem. Our population, we've got 21 million people in Florida, and that number will probably go up even as we get through this pandemic. And many of those people come from places that uh, do not burn, or they used to, but they don't anymore, like California. California has had similar um, social history and ecology similar to Florida. They had uh, an incredible diverse um, Native American population. Their landscape burned a lot before people started to build. Uh, and this is a big challenge. The conservation acquisitions are often fragmented. Um, we, you know, whether any kind of conservation acquisition program depends upon a willing seller. We can't go in and go, you know, this property would be great if it's like this, you know, shaped in a certain way. We have to go by what the uh, folks want to sell. And that presents a challenge to a land manager once it's actually purchased. There is competing priorities within conservation agencies. I used to work for the Florida Park Service. Um, there were days when it was a good burn day, but if the campgrounds needed cleaning, if there was an interpretation I had to do, um, you often had to put off something for another. Our staffing, um, well, the next line, lack of funding for dedicated professional fire staff. Um, I am the Florida fire manager for the Nature Conservancy, but I also have other duties as well. Most fire practitioners in our public lands have other jobs, and that's a challenge. Um, and so, you know, to try to increase staffing in public agencies is a challenge. And then the rapid change in land ownership use. We, like I mentioned earlier, I tip my hat to the um, cattle families who did so much work for our lands and some of the best conservation parcels we have today are ones that came from those large families. But imagine yourself a fifth generation Floridian, you know, your grandparents, your parents will say to you, you know, when we go, this, this 50,000 acres of land is yours. We raise cattle. You might clear a hundred grand a year if you work really hard. And then a developer comes to you and says, you know, this land that you've inherited, I'll give you five, $10 million for it. It's a, it's a challenge. And so there is this rapid change in what the land used to be, um, you know, how it used, how, what stewardship used to happen on it is changing. And there's a picture of smoke. Smoke is our biggest challenge by far as a fire practitioner. We know those lands need to burn. We know that they will burn in case of you know, drought and such. And so this is a challenge to work around the placement of roads, which is why it's incredibly important to um, to pay attention to where roadways you know will go could go um, that is one of our biggest impediments. So like Homer would say, why why would we even do this? Why would we take up the torch and 
risk so much? Well, why the heck are we burning? So this is just from my perspective as the Nature Conservancy. And that picture in the upper left shows a great crew a long time ago in Minnesota uh, doing a fire. And the picture on the bottom shows my crew in Central Florida on Tiger Creek Preserve um, doing a fire as well. Um, our, our equipment has modernized a bit. Our What we wear from our uh, Nomex fire gear has modernized a bit. We are a very unique organization that is a nonprofit that also abides by federal firefighting standards and guidelines. So we have the best of both worlds. We can work with um, private landowners. We can work with the highest level federal land managers to try all of us to get fire done. We understand if we're trying to protect nature, preserve life, save in the last great places, all of those different um, taglines, the heart of it is the processes that have shaped the land. Fire and water are the two biggest processes in Florida. If you alter them, if you alter the presence or absence or timing of fire and water, the habitats, the species you see will change. So the Nature Conservancy has uh, made a, a commitment to ensuring that fire gets done on the landscape. Try the best we can at multiple levels, government relations, um, agreements, and then just simply helping each other out with a phone call. You need help. So it's this blend, this little triangle. So there's fire management, which includes fire prevention and suppression, and then fire culture, you know, where fire has been a part of the landscape and try to learn more about that. Um, we have neglected, I will admit this, a lot of our fire culture, um, and we're beginning to finally realize that we were wrong. So I have worked a lot with um, uh, Native uh, uh, um the indigenous folks in the Everglades uh, in the Northwest in um, Oregon and Washington to try to um, really understand how fire has played a part in their culture, but also how they have shaped the land with that. And then you have fire ecology. So all of this combines to basically what we call integrated fire management, trying to keep people safe, trying to understand the background and history of fire and also understand the ecology what we want to try to preserve for the next generations. If we, as biologists, we, we know that if we can preserve the highest level of diversity we can in any kind of landscape, we can hand something off to the next generation with a better chance to, to mitigate whatever comes our way. If it's uh, warmer weather, wetter weather, you know, drier, cooler, if the landscape in of itself, shaped by fire, can be can be tended and then given to the next generation at a high diverse level, then we've done our job. So now we'll get to some cool fire pictures. Um, those of you, uh, you may or may not know Steve Morrison in the upper left, Sticky Steve, one of our great fire professionals in the Nature Conservancy, he's retired. Um, one of the great things about fire is that it brings together a diverse group of people to do this incredibly important job on the landscape. Fire doesn't recognize, um, well, actually, fire embraces diversity. Fire embraces whether, you know, whether it's gender, ethnic, religious, political diversity. Fire in of itself doesn't respond to differences in that. It embraces that. So a crew can be made up of anyone that can if you can stand the heat outside, if you want to be part of a great collaborative effort to get great conservation work done, if you are calm under pressure, because I will not, um, I mean, I have to be honest, it is a dangerous profession. People get hurt and die every year. Not as many as you would think, but it's still a very dangerous profession that um, requires you to think like a, you know, to care for your crew, to be very cognizant of what's going on. Those qualities embrace every single gender, religion, race, it, it's, which is one of the great things about fire. Uh, here's a picture of Bob Wilkin lighting fire with his uh, torch in a place in North Florida. Um, our fire crews wear what you see right there. So controlled burners, for the most part, wear a hard hat, which protects your head from uh, tree limbs. What's called Nomex, or basically fire retardant clothing, the shirt and pants will prevent an ember from catching you on fire. 
And then any kind of hand tool that you can use to basically shepherd the fire once you light it. The key ingredient of leading these fires is you have to be a part chess player and part sheep herder. Because you light a fire, you've got to, you've, you have, the ultimate goal is for the fire to put itself out. So you, you shepherd where it's going. You think like a chess player many hours ahead. You place people and equipment in a way to keep nudging, pushing it around. So you reach a blend of an ecological goal and a safety goal. Picture of a long leaf flatwoods burning. And look at those saw palmettos in the middle. Those of you who you know work with saw palmettos, they're just amazing plants. And look how this fire literally ran through those palms right after I took this picture, so about 10 seconds before. And notice the bud in the middle is still green. Perfect. The next day, the next week, the next two weeks, these saw palmettos may shoot forth a, uh, a, a stalk of uh, flowers because they, they have they have weathered that fire. They've embraced the fire. The um, fire has now given that soil nutrients, and it'll shoot up some flowers. We do a lot of fire training. This is a picture from Ordway Swisher Biological Station. Uh, I'm involved in training the next generation of conservation professionals that will um, understand fire, can do fire, and can use it as a way for employment, as a way to better understand where they live. One of my goals is, is to have folks trained in a way that they know how to do fire if they want to, but also they have a greater understanding of the role fire plays globally and our place in it. And that's a challenge. This is a great picture of a fire we did when I was with the Park Service. We actually planned a natural sand pine scrub fire by doing um, fires before this one took place, the year before, on our pine flatwoods downwind, where we were able to actually light what we call a head fire in sand pine scrub to observe natural fire behavior. Phenomenal. It had been quite impressive to see, you know, what we had planned uh, and what we actually conducted be a great success. And then one more quick thing. All this is ecology and training and all this. Well, guess what? The more that you do fire within your landscape, then the better prepared you are to handle and mitigate wildfires. And in my career, I've been doing fire for a long time. I now, I don't use that word as often as I used to, wildfire, because the landscape will burn. Uh, I will say fire that is uncontrolled. So what you're looking at now is when I used to work in Brevard County for the EEL program. Um, there, we did the uh, prescribed fire in uh, 2007 in the middle, and there was a wildfire that started basically from 95, which is sort of on the bottom of this picture, heading east. And this wildfire just, it was dry and it was, uh, it moved incredibly fast. And you can see the lines on the bottom there. Those are all um, tractor plow lines. The Florida Forest Service tried to put it out by putting in these lines, the fire ignored it. It hit that fire line, which is on the west side of that property. And notice that this fire happened in May of 2008. I did that control burn in November of 07. That fire hit that line, jumped into it, but notice it went out. And notice on the right side of this picture, that fire basically went around the, the area I burned and actually didn't stop till it hit the, the Indian River. So a great picture, and again, we don't use this often enough either, where uh, the more control burning you do, the lower the fuels are, and the better able you are to really get a handle and control uh, uncontrolled fires. And one more quick picture of a successful urban fire that I did for our county, where this was in um, Titusville. We did a 15-acre uh, scrub fire that was all it was called the Dicerandra scrub because it had a very rare Dicerandra thnicola in this scrub and scrub jays and people thought it was impossible you can't do this the both those species depended upon fire so this one took about two and a half years to plan but when everything went very well we were able to conduct a fire basically in the middle of homes um, you know urban suburban areas and it worked perfectly well so so, Val, that's it. I will say time for questions because now I will, I guess, stop sharing. Got it. Got it. Got it. 
I'm working on it. Where that? There it is. Wait. Got it. There I am. There I am. <laughs> Brian. <laughs> Hi, Brian. Oh my God, there's so many books. He's he's insane. And he's one of those people that writes so well that when you read his books, you go, I can't write like this. It's phenomenal. So um, it's Arizona State University, P-Y-N-E. Uh, he's got his own website. Oh my God, it's insane. There's so many books. Yeah, you'll be... You'll be you'll be reading that for a year, but they're great reading. Some discussion. There was some other discussion about books. Um, Taylor compliments your presentation. Very cool presentation so far. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> um, Taylor also asked if there's any opportunities for citizens to observe prescribed prescribed burns. Yes, um, that's a great question. So. Um, when I was with uh, Brevard County, we would invite the public out because some of our burns are on the roadside and they could see it. Um, often, a lot of the control burns that happen in parks and preserves are off the beaten path. It's tough for the public to observe them. I'd recommend uh, if you if you uh, are near a local park or preserve, talk to the park manager. Wakaba Springs State Park is a great example because of their main park drive. And when they do fire, they will allow traffic to go up and down that main park drive, so you can observe them closely. So a lot of the a lot of it depends on where you are. Um, some places it might be a bit too risky because of the type of fire they're doing, but for the most part, um, yes, most places you should be able to to observe it safely. Uh, what about with the Nature Conservancy? Is or what about parks managed by the Nature Conservancy? Uh, yes, the Nature Conservancy, so uh, the Disney Wilderness Preserve, if you contact me directly, we can let you know when there might be fires that take place. Um, Pre-COVID in uh, February or March, we did a public event that we invited people out to Disney Wilderness Preserve, and we did a fire right there on our main drive, just for that reason. I will tell you, if everything goes well in Gainesville, Next year, January, February-ish, we're doing a what's called a fire festival. So we're going to invite, I will be narrating a fire as it goes on. So we're going to have the public right there. So we plan on doing more of those too. Uh, but with us, uh, Disney Wilderness Preserve is the best. Um, I can get you my information. You can give me a shout. Our, our main fire um, season is typically January through June now. Awesome. Thanks, Zach. Oh, you're welcome. Um, and hopefully the video, I mean, so Val, the video kept going, no problem, because I couldn't see you at all, so. Yes, yes. Oh, awesome. Yes, I think there, your audio was a bit weird, and I think that's maybe because you turned off the webcam, or the webcam got oh. turned off. Yeah, so it's this is really clear, but it wasn't very clear. Oh, okay. Once it was off, so. Hmm. Yeah, I mean, we could hear you, but it was kind of, it was, the volume was changing, and there was some... Uh, Oh, that's weird. Oh, sorry about that. Yeah, that was weird. Yeah. Well, I'm glad everyone was uh, patient with that, though. Well, I mean, we kept on. We had six, and then we had seven, and then eight, and then nine, and so it seemed like pretty much everybody who got on stayed on. Okay, cool. Uh, um, so what else you got? Yes. Um, Taylor wants to know, are there any restrictions on burning your lot if you live in a suburban neighborhood? That's a great question. Um, so... Yes, potentially. And this is interesting. So um, if you're in a suburban area and a city area, the uh, city and county can have extra burn restrictions on you burning your land uh, based on what they view as hazards or risks, sometimes smoke or whatever. So even though Florida is a great state where you as a private landowner have the ability and right to burn your land, there often are other rest restrictions um, put on you. Um, from county and city. And the best way to find that out is to contact the local fire department. So the structure fire departments typically will know that. It's a great question. Because, yeah, I mean, it would be so, I knew someone, uh, my old boss, 
who lived in Longwood would actually burn his lawn. And so to the, you know, his neighbor was shocked at first, but then he was like, oh, that's cool. So. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No, it's, and it's, a, and it's a great, that's a great challenge that we need. So in the push to get our lawns more native, imagine if everyone's like where I live here, um, uh, in Orlando, I know just by looking at the landscape that it used to be sand hill, it used to be some sort of xeric oak. And imagine if all of our lawns were like wire grass, you know, and, and, and native plants, you know, where we could burn it and it would be so great. We have a long way to go, but that's kind of what I would envision would be the ideal rather than just our grass. And so then you would burn it more often, but yeah, the local fire departments would know that. Right. I mean, it, the Florida Native Plant Society actually finally owns property in what we call the Waria area, which is up by Ocklawaha, and we just burned it last week. I mean, it's what, seven acres. I mean, nice. the, the, the subdivision is a literal subdivision, but it's just not developed yet. And we just burned it. Nice. Nice. Well, that's the, and that's the best time to do that is when is before things are built. And then you keep doing that. If you reduce fuel, your smoke output is so low. And so that's a great time. Um, yeah. Here in Mead uh, Gardens, I'm hoping to actually do some fire with them they planted wire grass and so maybe that'll get that area going too yeah that's a cool sand hill restoration site mm -hmm, mm -hmm. um taylor also wants to know what can be done to increase funding for fire practitioners oh my god <laughs> uh do you have a rich relative um wow oh that's a great question so ah uh, I would say one of the things, and now we get into politics, um, because the amount of money available to fire suppression is astronomical. We are in a time where from 1910 on, the mechanisms, the machinery of fire suppression has been in so ingrained into processes and funding that it's almost impossible to push back against. Having said that, is fire suppression important? You bet. Fire suppression is a part of my fire plan. I know when I have to put it out. But what's been hap what has happened over all of these decades is that a governor can declare a state of emergency, federal funding, like in 1998 and 2001, can come in and pay for all kinds of suppression. It, similar mechanisms do not exist for controlled burning. And so the public agencies that do fire have to depend upon their own budget process, which is approved by the governor and cabinet. So what you can do is get politically involved, um, try to ask the question you just asked me to your local representative. There isn't anyone right now in our House um, that uh, or Senate that actually is embracing fire from the standpoint of what the question you asked me, but that doesn't mean that there can't be. So you ask a, an amazingly great question. And it's one that I've struggled with for a long time because my controlled burning uh, relies on grants, relies on funding from the nature conservancy. You as a landowner, it's your money. There should be money available for this. So let me just tell you real quick, my ideal. So imagine this, this is why you should vote for me as governor. Now you really should is the governor can declare a state of emergency and get money for wildfires. There's nothing that says a governor cannot declare a state of opportunity to then get money for control burning. We know when the good weather forecasts are. In January, it's good for three months. The governor says, I declare a state of opportunity. Let's get some money in. We'll direct our public agencies to do more fire. We'll actually allocate money to private folks to do more fire. It could be done. But what it takes is it's going to take a, a, a change of a political mindset to get there. So that's an awesome question. And it's it is very, 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 very hard, which is why the slides you saw, we work with each other all the time. My organization doesn't have enough people to do fire by itself, the Park Service, FWC. So we work together to make it happen. Um, so that's a great question. Get politically involved. Try to push one of your representatives to support funding for more control burning. 
awesome question. Oh yeah. So another great question. So people focus, oh, great question. So people focus on the season of fire. So all the stuff I showed you earlier, um, you know, scrub jays, gopher tortoises, plants, there's a lot of the, our diversity that depends upon what we call a growing season fire, spring ish fire based on what the current fire science has directed on lightning for millions of years. Some of that actually is debatable, but in our toolkit of fire, we burn 12 months out of the year because if I have a piece of property that is adjacent to a highway, adjacent to houses, and I know I've only got one wind direction to burn, and during the winter time, I know when the cold fronts happen, that's when I'll do it. So we use different seasons for different objectives. So ecological objectives are often nested within the management objectives of a fire because at the end of the day, one person has to put his or her name on that prescription to run the fire. And uh, they are responsible for people's safety, um, both on the fire and the public. So we use um, 12 months out of the year, depending on the goal. Ultimately, we want ecological goals, but we love winter fires because they, they give us um, the ability to do things in a more directed way, actually. Great question. <laughs> yeah, I love that question. That's awesome. Yeah, people are really, I mean, you can get, it's funny, you can get fire ecologists in a room and listen to all the fights and debates, but, you know, from a fire manager standpoint, we have to think of all of that. That's right. <laughs> okay, <laughs> well, uh, that looks like all the questions. Um, how can people get a hold of you? Um, uh, <laughs> it's, yeah, send me an email. Do we? Uh, can we send? So Val, can we send these people my email, or how do we? Yes, um, we can send. We can send the. We can put it in our Pine Lily email. Oh, let's do that. Yeah. So everyone listening and wants to get in touch with me, Val's got it. So. Yep. All right. Cool. We're good. Cool. Well, thank you all very much for tuning in tonight, and. Um, as you can tell, I absolutely love this subject. It's amazing. And um, again, thanks for tuning in. Thank you. <laughs>